Hello, in this episode we're going to look at how you can incorporate fruits and vegetables into your garden without it looking ugly. We're going to look at some des cunning designer tricks that you can use and it doesn't matter what size garden you've got, so even if you've got the tiniest of spaces and you want to grow vegetables to feed your family, we'll show you how to do it in this episode. If you're frustrated your garden doesn't look as beautiful as it could, even though you've purchased lots of lovely plants, then help is at hand. Plants are not enough. You have to have a good design layout. And when you combine design with the beauty of plants, that's when the magic really happens. It's our mission here at Successful Garden Design to show you how to do it. And it's much easier than you may think. I'm Rachel Matthews and I've been a professional international garden designer for over 25 years and I teach garden design online. Now, as vegetables aren't my main area of expertise, I'm bringing on board for this episode a guest expert, Nikki Jabour. Now, Nikki is a very well-known author and broadcaster. Um, she's been a best-selling author with her book, The Year Round Vegetable Garden, and she's going to discuss with us her latest book, which is called Groundbreaking Food Gardens. And we're going to be looking at some of the plans in the book that are the most inspiring and that will help you with your garden. And I'm very pleased to say that on page 134, you can see a garden that I've designed in Nikki's book and we'll be going through that in more detail at the end of the show and I'll show you how you can create a really attractive modern courtyard that is 100% food producing. Right, well thank you so much for taking the time to talk about your fabulous new book. I was so excited when it arrived. Uh, you thank know, you, I'm so sorry it took so long to get there. <laughs> it's okay, we've been working Slapped on this it. project for, well, is, is it 18 months? Is that how long it took? You know what, from start to finish it was two and a half years. <gasps> Whoa! Yeah, so yeah. to finally see it in print, it was like, oh, wow! <laughs> finally. It took a long time, but yeah, the illustration process took like a lot of time towards the end, so... Mm. No, it's, it's great. I've never seen a book quite like this. I've seen lots of just regular garden plans, but it, I thought it was genius to do it for vegetables because so many people are interested in that these days. And what have been the gardens that you find, or the plans that people have supplied you with that surprised you the most and that you've learned from? What are your favourites? Well, you're not allowed to say favourites, are you? But you I'm know not, what I mean. I'm favourite child. I would get in trouble. I know, precisely. But, you know, which, which uh, ones are you enjoying or surprised you a lot? Well, I hear a lot from people. I'm getting a lot of feedback on Facebook and Twitter and, you know, my radio show and just emails from people and comments from people. You know, Amy Stewart's Cocktail Garden is very popular. That's one of my um, favourites. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a big trend this year as well. Like, people are really, thanks to her book, The Drunken Botanist, which is such an interesting, fun read. Mm. Uh, you know, people are realising, wait a minute, I can grow some of the things I want to drink. So, you know, it's not just making salads with their crops, they're also making cocktails and things now. So uh, I think that's really interesting. And she includes, like, not, it's not just your typical, like, mint or your everyday kind of cocktail you know, ingredients. She's got all these really neat berries and herbs and, uh, you know, flowers that you can add to your cocktails. So I think that, that's really fun. And, of course, Joe Lample, uh, the host of Growing a Greener World in, in the U.S., I mean, uh, his pallet garden, I've been getting a lot of uh, comments about that as well. And a lot of people telling me that they're collecting pallets now to build some of these for their small space gardens. Mm, I loved his, his design. Because both of those, both the Drunken Botanist Garden and his garden, they're, they're very pretty to look at, which you wouldn't necessarily think of for such a small space. And yeah, and well, they both include lots of you know flowers as well. Yes. Uh, you know, like things like nasturtiums, edible flowers, and, and a lot of the really pretty vegetables, you know, like the leafy greens and stuff like that too. So yeah. No, Joe's very clever, and uh, uh, he mentioned to me recently that they have a video on their Growing a Greener uh, you know, World uh, Television uh, on, online, their website, and that is their most frequently watched video, the Palette Garden. Really? That's, it is. That's, yeah, yes. that doesn't surprise me. No, I know. It's, it's such an interesting project. It's so mm. easy and inexpensive to do. And you've got a lot of um, information in the book for people that are wanting to get sort of wildlife and pollinators and the more natural side of things. So can you talk me through some of those gardens? Well, I myself have a lot of wildlife in my garden. Unfortunately, they're deer. Oh, <laughs> so they eat your vegetables. Yeah, which is why I'm putting in an electric fence this spring. Yay! Uh, so we'll see how that works. But um, 
there are a lot of good things you want to attract to the garden, good creatures. And, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, Tammy Hartung, you know, who, you know, has a wonderful herb farm in the U.S., she encourages wildlife, like the good, the birds, the bats, you know, the bees, with her wildlife garden design. I mean, Jessica Walliser, uh, she and I do a website called Savvy Gardening Together. And, I mean, she's so inspiring. She's a bug expert. So she has a good bug garden. And basically, she's, you know, it's a lovely 20-foot by 30-foot garden, four-square design with a central area for perennial, you know, crops and, and herbs and flowers. But, you know, it's also, uh, she plants a lot of things to attract, you know, the pollinators, the, the butterflies, the bees, the, the, the wasps, the good guys, the good wasps, and also the good bugs like parasitic wasps, the teeny tiny ones you don't really see very much, but they're working hard in your garden. Um, so she includes things like sunflowers and zinnias and sweet alyssum and tucking them under her tomatoes or between her crops so that she can encourage more good bugs. And even if you don't have room, you know, for a pollinator garden, you know, or, or pollinating plants amongst your vegetables, you know, uh, Paul Zamet from the Toronto Botanical Gardens, he's a director of horticulture there and he in his design he includes a pollinator pot so even if you don't have a lot of space or just a balcony and you want to support these creatures he you know includes fun little ideas and really well placed plants for uh you know supporting them in a little pot so really it's not down to how much space you've got it's purely what varieties you put in i think so yeah for sure i mean you don't have to have a lot of space um, you know, in my garden, you know, when I'm when I'm choosing what to grow every year, which is hard because I want to grow everything, um, I'm thinking not just about me. I'm definitely not thinking about the deer, but I, I am thinking about the butterflies, you know, which we're seeing fewer of every year now, which is alarming. Mm -hmm. um, the bees, I mean, you don't see nearly as many bees as you did 10 years ago, and you know, so I take note when I see them because I'm so happy. Um, you know, so I'm thinking about them and I'm trying to provide not just food sources for them, but also maybe places where they can live, you know, call home, different places where they can nest. Uh, you could build a beetle bump, and beetles are such good creatures in the garden. Um, you know, you can give a, build a little bump of sticks and logs and, and debris, and, you know, they'll come in at night and eat some of the, the aphids and other bad bugs in your garden. Mm. Uh, so there's lots of ideas just for boosting production. Because if you encourage a lot of bees in your garden, you don't necessarily have to plant more vegetables to get more food. You, you'll have more, you know, flowers that get pollinated and, and therefore more crop. So uh, there's lots of things you can do to, to boost the yield without doing more work. Ah, oh, that, that sounds cunning. I like the sound of that, getting yeah. um, everybody else to come in and do the work for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's great that this trend is coming in and it, I'm hoping it's going to be more than a trend because people are so, they used to be, oh, bugs, yuck, get rid of them. But really, yeah. they're just the whole thing of having a vegetable garden that you or any kind of garden. You have to have all the little critters and everything doing their bit and the bugs are so important. So it's, it's good yeah. that finally, I mean, people like Carol Brown from Ecosystem Gardening, she does a lot of work on that and um, she sort of really opened up my eyes as to, you know, how important everything is because you just take it for granted, don't you, when you've grown up in the countryside. There's, there's stuff everywhere and, you know, you just expect it. You don't realise that actually with all the pesticides that we're using that they there is less and less these days, which is, you know, very bad for all of us. Yeah, and I'm really happy that I live in a municipality in Halifax here in Nova Scotia. Um, you know, you can't use pesticides. So if you have dandelions in your lawn, you can't go get weed and feed and put it on your lawn or, or Killex or some other type of chemical. We have to be organic. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so wonderful. I think, I hope that, that it's going to, you know, start helping the bee population and the pollinators and the butterflies. Because when you're spraying, you know, for dandelions, for example, you might be killing several, you know, ground nesting bees. Or, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. there's so much what we do has such an impact on the environment that I think gardeners are now are really becoming aware of this and uh, it's great to see actually. Plus you can eat dandelion leaves, they're delicious in salads. So. And you can make wine for your uh, botanical cocktail garden with the flowers. That I didn't know. Oh. oh, really? Dandelion wine, yes. And then of course you can take the roots and dry them and grind them up for a coffee-like drink. Oh, uh, yeah, I do actually drink uh, lots of dandelion tea and coffee, so... Uh, there you go, excellent. <laughs> yeah, I can see I'm going to be having to go through my dad's lawn and dig them up. <laughs> He'll be pleased. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure he will be. I pay my kids about a nickel every time, you know, for, per dandelion as they go out and pick them for <laughs> What else has been a really big hit in your wonderful book? Well, I've received a lot of comments about your garden. Have um, they? Design, because it's... It's, it's so, I think it's probably the most, um, you know, just beautiful garden in terms of layout. And, you know, it's, all, it's like some, you could, it's like your back area, like a courtyard garden. And it's, but it's so private and, and lush and mm. colorful, but with so many edible elements, you know, from fruits and, you know, berries and flowers, edible flowers. And, uh, you know, and of course, all the different vegetables and that you, you really considered the textures and the colors of the vegetables themselves, you know, so it's, um, it's such a beautiful space that it's, it's one of those gardens you put in your backyard and people would walk through it and say, 
this is an edible garden. They'd mm. be very surprised, I think, that it produces yes, so much thank food. you. Yes, yeah. that was the main aim, to have something that would look designery, that would yeah. sort of appeal to people that, you know, want something quite modern and clean cut, but at the same time, you can eat pretty much everything in it. So, so it was fun to do, so thank you very much for inviting me to submit a plan. Well, I, I was thrilled. I'm, I'm very grateful that you took the time, because I know it was a lot of work, <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> well, one day I will reproduce everything I've done on that garden in my own little patch, and uh, so it won't go to waste. No, I'm glad, and I hope many other people are going to as well. I'm telling everybody yeah. uh, to send me photos of what they're doing. And, you know, um, I got one on the weekend, actually, from, uh, from a gentleman who, and I posted on Facebook, so people can find me on Facebook and look at it there. Uh, he recre he's recreating part of uh, Laura Matthews' concrete and steel garden. Which yeah, she, uh, I like that idea. Yeah, she was just using blocks. concrete blocks, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I've never thought of that. Inspired, uh, yeah, at the Philadelphia Flower Show a couple of years ago, they were using a lot of recycled materials, and that's where she saw the idea, uh, created this uh, garden, and now people are replicating it as well, which is so great to see. Yeah, brilliant. No, I, I really liked hers, because you could, I thought that those concrete blocks would be ideal for things like mint that just like to take over. Yeah. You've got them all nicely contained. Definitely. So if people haven't yet, and who knows why, but if they haven't yet ventured out and done anything vegetable or fruit-wise in their garden yet, what top tips would you give people for that are just starting out? What's your main advice to them? Well, I always say the same thing when people ask me with their first garden, because everybody gets really excited when they first yes. think, I want to grow vegetables. And, um, you know, I had an email from someone last year who went out and dug a 40 by 40 foot plot in their backyard, and I'm like, for their first garden. I'm like, that's a little big. Mm. I say start small with either, you know, maybe four or five containers or maybe just a small four by eight foot plot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, grow four or five types of vegetables, grow them well, grow your favorite ones, have fun with it. Uh, and then next year, if you, if you were successful and you enjoyed it, you can always go bigger, you know, but you definitely don't want the garden to become a chore. You want it to become a place that you're really enjoying. And any gardener, I think, knows the pleasure of going out and working in the soil and, and doing these little tasks that, um, you know, that are just make gardening so much fun and so enjoyable. And so, you know, it's a great place to de-stress after a long day or get out in the morning with your cup of tea and, and do a little bit of work. I mean, it's just invigorating. So, um, so it beca doesn't become a chore. I would always advise people to start small and, uh, and just have fun with it. You know, don't stress about it. If you see a bug, good chance it's a good bug. So don't, you know, I mean, go Google it. You know, or take a picture and, 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 you know, tag me on Twitter and I'll see if I can identify it for you. But um, just have fun with it. Don't worry about it. You know, Mother Nature, you know, sometimes she's unpredictable. And the weather, you know, every summer is not the perfect weather. But uh, generally speaking, we always have a bounty of so many different types of crops. So have fun. Don't be afraid to experiment. Grow what you like to eat. Start small. Those That's are very good advice, actually, because it's easy to get carried away. And you buy all these seed packets, like... For me, I, I've got this thing against raw tomatoes. Like, I can't stand them. I love anything cooked, tomato, fine. Yeah. Raw, no. My first year with an allotment, I ended up doing so many different tomato seasons. Not to the germination. I don't actually like tomatoes. Why, why did I do that? It's just because they were there and I just couldn't stop myself. I totally understand. I'm the same way. I mean, and, and when you see something that it may be overwintered and, and is germinating up in the spring, you're so happy to see it, like a tomato or kale. But I just don't want to get rid of it, even if it's not where I want it or what I want. <laughs> I'll dig it up and move it around somewhere else. Mm, so, yeah, that's very good advice. Start small. and But also, have you noticed, is there a trend more that people are incorporating vegetables into their everyday garden? Or are they having sort of specific vegetable patches? Or is it a whole mix of the two? I think it's a mix of the two, and I'm actually, uh, embarrassingly enough, finally doing some landscaping this year on my property. I've been neglected it for years. So, you know, I'm putting in a new garden, and as I do that, and putting in things like ornamental grasses and daylilies, mm -hmm. uh, I'm also putting in kale, you know, oh, and, and like some of the more beautiful types of kale and Swiss chard. So I think people are doing both. I, I love to tuck things like kale and Swiss chard uh, amongst my flowers, especially the beautiful varieties of Swiss chard, like Bright Lights, or there's a new one this year called Peppermint, or Peppermint Stick, depending mm -hmm. who you buy it from. And uh, it's just like the, 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 the stems are hot pink, uh, mm -hmm. with streaked with white, like, like a peppermint stick. And I mean, it has the same flavor as a regular Swiss chard, but it's very beautiful. Looks great in a pot, looks great in a garden. Mm -hmm. uh, just very eye-catching. So I think you can do anything, whether you have your own specific you know, herb plot or you know, plot for your veggies, or you want to just tuck them amongst what you already have. If you have you know, perennials, you could put a lettuce edging along the front, maybe like green and red and green and red, 
or some curly parsley. There's a lot of edibles that are very ornamental, like as you've mentioned as well, uh, as delicious. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to, to interplant things together. Even in a pot, you might have Swiss chard and lettuce mixed with some of your petunias. I mean, you certainly can do that. There's no rules. So do whatever it makes you happy. Mm, great advice. Brilliant. Yeah. So, Nikki, if people want to come and check out you and find out more about your book, where's the best place they can come and contact you and read more about you? Um, they can find me on nikkijabor.com. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. From there, you can get to my blog and you know Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and um, and then also, you know, then they can find out more about my radio show, which they want to listen to it. They can listen to it online as well. So uh, they can find me there. And then I also collaborate in a website called Savvy Gardening, mm -hmm. um, which has been a lot of fun this year. We just launched a couple months ago and posting a lot of really interesting articles on gardening that you don't maybe normally hear about so much. So maybe okay. people might want to check that out too. Great, brilliant. Well, I'll put links in all the show notes so people can Thank come you. and find you, and also obviously a, a link to your book. So it is in all bookstores, not just um, Amazon, so people can get it anywhere. Yes, they can. And, and thank you very much for talking to me. This has been really fun. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much. So I do hope you got plenty from this week's episode and it's given you lots of inspiration and ideas for how to grow fruits and vegetables in your garden. And I will put all the links to everything we've discussed today in the show notes, which can be seen at successfulgardendesign.com forward slash show 10. So I do hope that you'll check out Nikki's new book and have a look at all of the plans because there's loads more great ideas in here that will really help you grow fruit and veg in your garden. And obviously, you know, turn to page 134 because, you know, my one's there. Okay, until next time, I'll see you then. And if you'd like some more top tips on how to add the wow factor to your garden, I've created a cheat sheet that you can download and a short video tutorial that walks you through the top five things that you must do if you want to create a stunning garden. So head on over to successfulgardendesign.com forward slash wow and you can download your cheat sheet there. Mm -hmm.